Hi everyone, this is a um, quick presentation of some of our product with um, the team from Explore. So to give you an introduction to, to who we are, um, there's a number of people here in our product team and today there are three of us talking through some of our more unusual destinations that we offer. We've got Ali Butler who looks after our Africa, Middle East and self-guided product. She'll be talking about the Benin and Togo voodoo discovery trip. Um, I'm Carmel, the Americas and Australasia product manager, and I also look after our Saudi Arabia tour. And we also have Chris, who looks after our Asia product. So he'll be running through Pakistan, southern India and Laos with you. And we just want to give a bit of um, an idea of how we... Um, how we develop tours and the kind of trips that you can expect to be doing with Explore, taking you to the highlights and getting you a little bit off the beaten track as well. So we'll get going with Benin and Togo with Ali. Hi, so um, Benin and Togo Voodoo Discovery. This tour through the incredible countries of Togo and Benin has been created for travellers who want to get off the beaten track and visit part of the world rarely touched by tourism. Um, expect to see lots of colourful dresses, hear drumming, see voodoo ceremonies and meet friendly people and that help bring these fascinated, fascinating places to life. It's a full on trip with long drives and sometimes on bad roads. There are four nights in basic accommodation. There's unreliable hot water and electricity. Facilities are often basic and may be shared and little to no Wi-Fi. But don't let this put you off. It's well worth the effort and it's what, part of what makes it so great. So consider it as a digital detox. Um, but it is worth saying it's not the right trip for everybody. So when you're selling this to your customers, make sure they are aware and they're ready to embrace this as part of their holiday experience. Um, the trip starts in Lome, the capital of Togo, um, once an important landmark within West Africa's notorious slave route. Togo was colonised in the 15th century and can still be seen today by the faded European architecture and tree-lined boulevards. Um, our tour leader takes us around the fascinating city, bringing the past to life by visiting colourful markets and Togo's famed fetish market where locals and voodoo priests alike can source anything from a good luck charm to an animal skull to aid their pursuit of bringing themselves good fortune and health. Um, from here we drive north to Kaplame where we walk in the rainforest notorious for its many butterfly species and in the evening watch a fire dance. Um, we visit the villages of Basar, which are famous for their conical roofs, um, mud houses, and they look a little bit like medieval castles. That's the bottom left picture on your screen now. We drive through the Atkora Mountains and then cross the border into Benin. And we walk here in the remote mountain range and meet more fascinating tribes and learn about their ancient traditions. Next stop is on to Dasa, which used to be the capital of the ancient kingdom, and we visit the sacred hill where funerals for the royal family take place accompanied by voodoo practices. We will see two mask ceremonies with people dressed in bright, colourful costumes and participants emerge from the forest and perform a procession through the, the village streets. Then we travel by bus and boat on to Ganvi, which is the largest stilt village in Africa. And the village is an atmospheric setting of thatched huts on, on, on the water. Um, the stilts are made from teak wood. And this is yeah, the top left picture here. This is very much daily life is conducted on the waters of the lake. And we have the opportunity to stay in a guest house on the lake. We'll also meet the local oracle here or a village soothsayer and learn about these traditional people and um, how they're guided through life by drums and dancing and the haunting rhythms of voodoo. Um, next stop will be Widar, which is one of the main trading ports for slaves, but it's also the spiritual heart of voodoo. And we have one food voodoo festival departure each year for this trip, which is in December. And they spend a day in Widar watching the voodoo processions and ceremonies taking place. Um, and our last stop on the trip is Grand Popo, which is where we see a mask ceremony. And this in the top left picture, you can see the full body straw decorations that people wear. Then we cross back into Togo, where the trip ends in Lome. So it really is a fascinating experience, very colourful, um, 
lots of very photogenic moments on the trip um, and really unlike anything you're going to see anywhere else. So if you are prepared for a little bit of rough and rugged travel, the rewards are, are well worth it. Um, yep, yeah, so that's Togo and Benin. Thanks, Ali. Um, moving on to Saudi Arabia now. So Explore have um, a long sort of tradition and reputation of developing trips in quite challenging countries, um, quite unusual destinations. And I don't think any trip that we have really embodies that more than, than Saudi Arabia. It only opened to tourism in 2019. Uh, right in November. Before that, you could not get a visa for leisure travel. So visas were restricted only to pilgrims doing Hajj or um, Umrah or business travellers. So it's absolutely brand new. Obviously, then after 2019, the country closed down its borders due to the COVID pandemic. So really, it's only been in the last six months that um, proper leisure tourism has been able to happen in the country um, and we have a trip that runs from Riyadh um, the capital across to the Red Sea port of Jeddah and it's a overview of the country from deserts to mountains to the Lawrence of Arabia's Hejaz Railway, um, the Middle East's largest camel market, wonderful UNESCO heritage sites. Um, in the top left is probably the pinnacle of the tour, really. Um, it's called uh, Hegra or Mada in Salah, and it's an ancient Nabataean city, which is second only to Petra. Um, it's the same civilization who built Petra, and this was one of the major cities on their trading route um, that became their, their, as I said, second city. That's one of the absolute highlights of, of the trip um, to visit the, the tombs and to explore that in the desert setting. But aside from that, um, it, it's a really diverse um, country. So you've got the Waba crater, which um, the people, even scientists are still disputing how it was formed. Um, it's thought to have been formed by a meteor. and we do a walk around that is absolutely astounding not all the way around it's massive but um just pa past the um around some of the rim it's an easy walk suitable for all levels we visit that's the floating mosque which is found in Jeddah on right on the Red Sea um and Jeddah itself is a fantastic place to end the tour it's so um laid back which is a surprising word to use for Saudi Arabia but that really is the sort of atmosphere that it encapsulates and in the bottom right was one of my favourite places that I went which was um, uh, the sort of atmospheric village of Diane which is a desert completely deserted now but a mountain village in the area called Baha and in that area you have mountains over 3,000 metres so it's really something unexpected for travellers um, and we have run groups there since November so we've had about 12 tours already and the feedback has been excellent and this area was a, a surprise highlight for most customers so far because it's just so it's so lush mountainous rugged totally unexpected when you're thinking about um, the Middle East being a lot of desert um, and the people are really friendly you get Arabic tea and dates pretty much everywhere you go so on entrance to every hotel lots of the sites that you visit people will genuinely um, approach you with with curiosity with friendliness it is um, an eye-opening place to go that um, is slightly different let's say from the, the people who actually live there are a different side of uh, what you'll see to what the how the media portrays the um the country and with that in mind one of the men, major things that i get asked personally especially as a as a female traveler to the country is what do i need to wear um there's other questions 
that I'd be more than happy to answer as well um, for any customer who wants to go. I love talking about Saudi Arabia, but the clothes are quite important to mention. So that's me in the top picture with our tour leader. So I'm wearing a T-shirt, um, which uh, I was in the mountains. And really in those rural areas you, where you're not going to really come across many, many other people, um, for women, short sleeves is fine. I'd wear long trousers, um, traders and a short sleeve T-shirt, fine. In the cities um, or where we were passing through sort of more populated areas, I'd have a long sleeved shirt on either over the top. I had a de denim shirt that I'd put on over it or some loose fitting, lightweight thing. Um, always long trousers and uh, really like that. It was perfectly comfortable and great to travel around there were two areas where we did have to cover up and that's that picture on the bottom left um that's medina the second holy city where you'll see the second biggest mosque and the second biggest um most important place really in the muslim world so second to mecca uh that's the city of medina and it is obligatory there it's really only just opened up to tourism in October last year uh, so it's very very new there and we were asked to wear the abaya the long that's the long black dress and the headscarf as well but otherwise fine in even in everywhere else through the trip Riyadh, Jeddah all the cities to have your hair loose no headscarf um, and just modest um, modest clothing sort of loose fitting and I felt very comfortable, very safe um, throughout the entire trip. It was a really fantastic experience. So moving on from Saudi to the Americas, which is really um, where my specialty lies. And I want to talk to you about Nicaragua, first of all. So for me, this is really one of the most underrated countries in the Americas. Everyone knows about Costa Rica everyone anyone who's everyone who has heard of it has either traveled there or wants to travel there but Nicaragua is just next door and it has an astounding amount of wildlife um it has very similar geography so it has rainforest and cloud forest as well similar to Costa Rica as well as 26 volcanoes all packed into a tiny space um, and what's more it has some outstanding um, cultural opportunities as well. So you've got the old colonial cities of Granada and Leon, but you also have really interesting social history um, recently in the last sort of 40, 50 years. So the, the revolution happened in the late 70s and 80s, which is really ever present today. Um, and it's it's kind of full of contrasts. You've got bird watching, boat trips, volcanoes, craft markets, architecture, a little bit of everything and it's quite a small country relatively small so it's easy to get around um most of the places in with with short drives and in a very comfortable vehicle with really nice um hotels many of them are sort of colonial style buildings especially in leon and granada so it's a really um quite comfortable trip but to a fascinating place um, that bottom left is a highlight for many people. So that's the Messiah volcano. There's only a few spots around the world where you can actually see lava inside a crater. Messiah is one of them. It's right next to um, a really awesome craft market, which is well known for leather goods. So um, you can meet local producers, buy from them directly um, and really sort of get to grips with with what makes Nicaragua special in terms of the people. We also stay in a homestay in a community up in the mountains around San Ramon. That's a coffee making community and they've set up a sort of eco-tourism collective to host visitors. Um, so we get shown some of their lifestyle, how the coffee's harvested, how to cook local dishes, how medicines are produced from the land. And there's loads of great walks, great hikes in the area to waterfalls, loads of nature spotting and bird spotting 
opportunities and people really enjoy that um that homestay opportunity and it is still two people to a room so it's still a twin room basis uh, even though it's a homestay so it's it's a comfortable way to um to dive into uh to sort of the local culture and then another real good highlight for me is is the Ometepe Island ferry trip um so just to go back to that slide before uh it's the this is the ferry tour and that's going over to the island on the top left picture um and there you can visit a woman's cooperative there's again loads of bird watching experience it's really laid back island that's a big retreat from the cities of, of Managua the cities of Granada and Leon which are busy um walking through nature reserves so it's a really good tour for wildlife there's also turtle spotting opportunities from July through to November in San Juan del Sur that's the top left picture there um kayaking around the isletas on on Lake Granada um so it's a diverse mix of culture of wildlife of different geographies from the Pacific coast to to rainforest um, and volcanic landscapes that encapsulates Nicaragua really in a nutshell. Let's move on from there to another revolutionary highlight of the Americas, which is Cuba. Um, We've got a lot, uh, quite a few trips in Cuba available. So we do offer walking tours and cycling trips as well. This one is our most popular trip. It covers the island from west to east. You have time there at the beach, in the mountains and around the cities um, of Havana and Trinidad and Santiago. The thing that I have most taken from my time in Cuba is the music. It's really everywhere. So they have um, a thing called a Casa de la Musica, which is in all of the cities. And it's basically a live music place, a a bar uh, where every night there's going to be some kind of live salsa and the one in Trinidad in particular is really special it's in the open air it's above um, the main plaza in Trinidad and they if you watch locals dancing salsa it's just such an experience like they feel that music deep in their bones it's so so such an amazing um, thing to see and of course, you get all of the vintage cars. They're all over Havana, all over on, on the drives. Cuba's been under um, economic sanctions for, for many, many years, for 50, 60 years now. And Cubans are really entrepreneurial and really handy. They've had to be able to fix these cars out of nothing. So you have the shells of these beautiful old vehicles with, uh, it, it might be a, um, a Ford or a Chevrolet or something with a totally different engine inside, you know, getting the most mileage that they can out of these vehicles. It's quite amazing to see. And um, so that's something that is is sort of ubiquitous. Of course, the, the tobacco and the cigar industry is the same. So you'll see how leaves are actually dried, converted into cigars in a small tobacco producer around Vinales. We also get the Caribbean Sea. So we have um, a night there in a place called Santa Lucia and several other swimming opportunities during the trip. We visit the Bay of Pigs. Um, obviously, that's the, the famous um, location of the US attempted invasion. We visit um, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara's hideout in the um, Sierra Maestra mountains, we visit the Revolutionary Museum. All of that history is is everywhere and deeply entrenched in Cuban culture. It's, it's fascinating to speak to the tour leader about that. Um, and one real quirk of, of Cuba is um, another type of homestay called a Casa Particular. And this was a sort of th this gave um local cubans the right to earn their own money by renting out rooms in their house so it was a, a small site of private enterprise in cuba which is mainly state run 
Um, there are loads and loads of these all across Cuba and we stay in them in Trinidad, in the small town of Trinidad. Um, and they're really wonderful opportunities. There's four, usually four to six rooms in a house that are let out by the people. Some of them have now run really like B&Bs but very local. The owner is still ever present, cooking breakfast, all of that stuff. Um, and in Trinidad in particular, they're in quite old colonial style houses. Um, so really beautiful, often have roof terraces. Um, it's a nice way to uh, get into the heart of Cuban culture. And then the bottom left as well, is another great accommodation that we use, which I wanted to pick out, which is the Hacienda in the Escambre Mountains. So it's not all cities, cars, tobacco and beach. We visit the mountains in the Escambre and we do two days of um, very soft, easy hikes there to waterfalls, wild swimming opportunities there. And we stay in two different Haciendas, which are um, these buildings here on the bottom left. And we camp in the grounds of these haciendas or on hot, um, when it's warm, you, we have sleeping mats are, are provided, all of that's provided and you can sleep outside under the eaves of the hacienda. And that's great. The skies there are fantastic at night. So it's really camping out under the stars and the meals there are also outstanding. So we'll move on from Cuba now to the final trip in the Americas, which is Brazil. And we explored who basically one of the most comprehensive trips around Brazil um, that you can find from a small group tour operator. We do have a lot of domestic flights in this itinerary, but it's the only way to cover such vast distances and to get our customers around as much as the country as, as we can do in, in two weeks, basically. So. We start off in Salvador, which is um, a really, really fascinating uh, city in northern Brazil with a high population of Afro-Brazilians. Um, it was a big slave trading port um, many years ago. And so this African heritage is now seen in the food, in the rhythm of the music and the religion there is called Candomblé which is based on a variety of different African beliefs. So it's um, it's an unusual start into the, the city, into the country, sorry, which many people aren't really expecting. You know, you're thinking about Rio, you're thinking about Latin, Latin rhythms and all of that. Um, but Salvador is a fantastic, small, compact city with some of the best preserved 17th and 18th century buildings in the whole of the Americas. So the old town is an awesome place to walk around and to start your trip really relaxed. Then we fly from there into the Amazon. So classic, um, classic uh, Brazil trip really and um, what you would expect from Brazil and I just wanted to highlight that accommodation as well so top left is our Amazon Lodge and it's only it's only accessible by boat so once we've flown to Manaus we get um, a bus to the the boat port and then we we board our boats across to the lodge so it's a fantastic um, arrival as well um, and then from there, we go to the Pantanal. So bottom left, so Pantanal is an enormous wetland area and really is going to provide one of the best wildlife spotting opportunities in the Americas. A lot of people think that the Amazon is great for wildlife and it, it obviously hosts thousands and thousands of species, but it's so vast that you explore it really from the riverside so you're only going to see what's on the river banks or in the canopies around the river that's a lot of bird life and you have amazon river dolphins as well which are really um cool to see the pink river dolphins uh you've got other turtles caiman that kind of thing but in the pantanal as a wetland area it's explored mainly by either jeep or by boat and it gives you a much greater opportunity for spotting larger animals, um, capybara and um, anteater and armadillo, just to name just to name three. Uh, so it's that is really your best wildlife experience that you're going to have on this trip and indeed throughout the Americas. 
and we go from there to Iguazu, to the Iguazu Falls. So just to go back here, that's an iconic shot of them, but super impressive. And we visit both the um, Brazilian and we give people a um, chance to cross the border and go to, from the Argentinian side as well. So they get two totally different views. Um, and then it's Rio, so it needs no explanation, really. We'll go up Sugarloaf Mountain. We'll see Christ the Redeemer. We also go to this um, project called the Mourinho Project. That's the, the top right-hand corner of the screen. And that's um, been set up in one of the favelas of, of Rio by people who lived in the favela. And it's like an art installation, really, that you can go and visit and walk around. And they have perfectly replicated the favela that they're from in mainly bricks, but also other types of material that were found and got in the favela. So they're they've painted it but built it up so with roads with tiny little vehicles um toy size vehicles to represent the favela and when you're visiting it um with the with the people who made it they'll tell you all about why they made it they'll tell you all about life in the favela so it's not it is not a favela tour it's um uh, it's an art project, really, that these guys have done to kind of give give people an understanding and an overview of the beauty as well as the downsides of living in the favelas. You know, they want to um, they want to celebrate where they're from and their roots. And that's what's so interesting about it. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you can expect on on Explores Tours in terms of we're getting you to the highlights so we're taking you to Rio and we're taking you to the Amazon and the Pantanal but we're going to see, show you a bit of a different um, and maybe unexpected side of those places. Um, so that's me done with the Americas and Saudi and now I'll move on to Chris who's going to talk you through a couple of our uh, unusual trips in um, Asia. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm Chris, um, I am the uh, product manager for Asia. Um, I've been product manager for Asia for about six years, um, but to be honest, my love affair with Asia uh, has gone on for a lot longer, really since I've, I, I was first able to travel to the continent. And I would say my nowhere in Asia is my love stronger for than if for India. Um, and I thought I'd try and start by trying to explain, trying to explain what is India all about and how is it how is it different. Um, one of my friends once described India as uh, you leave the hotel in the morning and you go and you spend the entire day out in India and you only as you cross the threshold back into the hotel at evening do you go ah and I think that so perfectly encapsulates the experience in India it's a bit of a cliche but it is really an absolute assault on the senses for better or for worse it is fantastic everything is overwhelming you are just hit with this bright these bright colors these amazing smells these sounds just people everywhere chaos sometimes to be honest with you but that's part of the charm of it. Um, and it is just everything is on overdrive. So your eyes are out on sticks. You're just taking it all in. It is it is a completely overwhelming and fantastic experience. Not for everyone, admittedly, but if you're able to just be able to kind of let go a little bit and let let the you know let India flow over you, you, you will absolutely love it. And that, that's probably the, the best way I can kind of encapsulate that. Now it is called this Indian subcontinent, and that is with good reason because India is is more of a continent than it is a country. Um, the north is very, very different from from the south, and actually, a lot of the things that I've just described are more akin to the north of India. Um, the south of India, in general, is a lot more laid back. Um, it's actually different in many ways. So they speak a different language. They they eat very different food. Um, they uh, you know, their their sort of it's just general their sort of culture and their history and their religion. Everything is different, but the key thing you'll find is it's a little bit more laid back. So if you have any customers that are um, 
want to experience India, but are a little, you know, they, they've got a little bit of trepidation, then pointing them towards southern India is, is the way to go because it's India, but just toned down a little bit. Um, so, yeah, this particular trip is uh, the highlights of southern India, a really popular trip for us. Um, most people just tend to, most operators tend to focus on Kerala, uh, which admittedly is absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, but we actually take in the whole of southern India. Um, so this trip takes it, uh, the, the two states of Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Kerala is generally better known for its sort of nature um, and its spices as well, herbs and spices. It's really important part of, of the um, old spice trade. And Tamil Nadu is more for sort of temples and culture. So I just thought I'd take you through a few of the highlights of the trip. Um, starts uh, So starting with my favourite, which is Kochi. So Kochi is an old Portuguese trading port. Um, and you'll see this colonial history throughout the throughout the city. It's quite a small city. You can walk end to end very, very sort of half an hour. Um, but you've got beautiful old Portuguese, Portuguese colonial buildings. Um, you've got these lovely sort of um, elegant cafes and bars and whatnot. Um, but and also these these Chinese fishing nets that you see in the in the picture above and going down there at sunrise or at sunset, watching the fishermen go out or especially at sunset, watching the fishermen come back and and get uh, and load their catches, bring their catches out the net. It's, it's a wonderful thing to do and very, very photogenic. Um, other highlights on the trip, you've got a, a, a cruise out on the backwaters. Um, so, Kamo, if you just flick to the next slide, please. Uh, you've got a, a cruise out on the backwaters. Oh, I haven't. Oh, yeah, there you go. The bottom right hand. So you've got all these um, traditional rice barges that have been converted into sort of houseboats. You spend a night out um, cruising the, the backwaters. It's even more laid back in the backwaters, a kind of languid pace of life. Um, and you basically just spend the whole day cruising through the backwaters, watching the world go by, watching the locals do their washing in the river, watching people fish. Uh, you can pull on t up to the side of the market and barter for some fresh fish for dinner. Um, it is just a fantastic experience and, and really, really relaxed. Um, other highlights, we've got um, Uti. So um, um, Snooty Uti, as it's known, is, a, is an old, hill, old British colonial hill station up in the hills where the British used to retreat in the summer to escape the heat. Um, and you can actually ride uh, one of the, the toy trains up there, the, the steam trains up to Uti. Um, and then just picking out a couple of other places as well. So you've got uh, Mysore, which is uh, right in the centre of southern India, which has got some incredible palaces and architecture. Um, Pondicherry, which is which is much more of a French influence, um, and Madurai is the other place I would probably pick out, which um, in one of the other pictures you've seen uh, have these amazing temples, the Temple of Manakshi. And another difference between South India and North India is the colour. So a lot of the Southern Indian um, temples pop with colour. They've got blues, reds, greens, yellows, everything. Whereas the southern, uh, northern Indian tend to just be white or marble. Uh, the southern Indian is it's all about the colour. And, and colour is probably a feature of the trip. You can see in these pictures here, you've got a Kathakali dancer there applying face, mar uh, face paint. Uh, that's a really interesting thing to go and see. They kind of tell their story uh, through in, like interpretive dance. You can see that in Kochi. Um, and then this is um, citing some elephants in the wild in Bandapur. So really, really um, varied trip, much more comprehensive, hopefully, than, than what other people are offering. Um, and I hope that just goes a little bit away to explain what I think you can you can get out of India and why I think it's so amazing. So moving on, uh, we've now got Laos. Um, so again, I just want to give you a bit of background about Laos. It's probably the most least well-known uh, country in Southeast Asia, uh, but probably also the most underrated. And actually, that is part of its charm. Um, it is a complete opposite of India in that it is the most laid back country you're probably ever going to, to travel to. And certainly the, the most laid back people you're ever likely to encounter. There's a bit of a joke that everything runs on Lao time. And even you, when you go there, you will just slow down and relax to their pace of life. Um, to try and describe it a little bit, it's, it's kind of like again to use another cliche it is like thailand was 30 years ago uh thailand is a fantastic destination um very very varied but it has 
because of it's almost been a victim of its own success. The infrastructure now is excellent um, and it's very westernized. You know, there are many Western hotels, many Western food chains, um, and it's very, very easy to get about. And some might say it's lost its sense of authenticity a little bit, whereas Laos, absolutely not. You know, it's, it's really not very westernized at all. They don't really have any chains. Um, and you're going to get a really kind of authentic, charming experience of Southeast Asia. Um, and it will feel a little bit like you're, you're stepping back in time. Um, so Laos is slightly different as well from Thailand and, and, and some of its other neighbors um, in that it uh, was part of French Indochina. Um, so Laos, Vietnam and Cambodia form part of French Indochina um, back in the 1800s. And actually, even even now, it still uh, retains a lot of that, uh, a lot of that sort of French colonial charm. Um, and it's reflected in, in the food and drink. So there's a big cafe culture in, in Laos. Um, and also you can get some fantastic uh, baguettes and, and, and sort of Southeast Asian take on French food. Um, and again, it just makes it quite a unique destination. Um, this itinerary is very comprehensive. Many of our other operators tend to just focus in that northern part of Laos, um, whereas we, uh, we, we cover the whole country and we go down to the south as well. So uh, the highlight of Laos, I think, for most people is Luang Prabang. Um, certainly is my favorite city in Southeast Asia. Really, really charming city set in the foothills. Um, beautiful temples, beautiful French colonial villas and buildings. Um, as the bottom left hand picture you can see there, uh, that is a shot of um, Luang Prabang and the Nam U River flowing through it. Um, very, very beautiful place. And it's the sort of place where you can actually just go and um, sit and unwind and, and relax and just watch the world go by for a day. But there are lots of things to see or, and do around it. You've got the Kwangsi waterfall, which is a picture that is synonymous with Lao, those beautiful kind of turquoise colours of the waterfall. Um, you, the, you also have um, Vientiane, the capital, which again is very much um, very much uh, famed for its its <laughs> its very laid back life very laid back lifestyle. Um, but as I say, we focus also on some other areas. So we go to the uh, Plain of Jars, um, which is a bit of a um, I haven't got a picture of it, but it's a bit of a mysterious area in the east of Laos uh, with these big um, stone jars in the landscape. And no one really sure how they got there. Um, but also it's quite a focal point for the Vietnam War um, because um, an unknown fact is that uh, more bombs were actually dropped on Laos in the Vietnam War than in Vietnam or in Cambodia. Um, and a lot of that unexplored ordnance, unexploded ordnance fell in this, this province of Ponsevin where the Plain of Jars are. So you'll learn a little bit about the Laotian War and also some of the amazing um, charity work that is going on to support the locals with all of this unexploded audience ordinance. Uh, we also visit down into the south and this is this is a really quite a rural uh, destination known for its uh, so the, the area is called the 4000 Islands and that's because the Mekong is at its widest point and there are all these little islands dotted through it and the top left hand picture you can see the kind of scenery that you're going to you're going to see there uh, little pinch points for the Me Mekong which creates these lovely white waters um, and yeah we do we do some cruises out on the on the Mekong there you get a really good chance of seeing Irrawaddy uh, river dolphins uh, that are native to this part of the world um, and we do a bit of walking there's some wonderful waterfalls there um, and yeah just take in the scenery and, and meet some of the local tribes that, that are down there that seldom see any westerners so it's a really kind of uh, offbeat authentic experience in this part of Laos. Uh, the trip ends in Bangkok um, which really to be honest with you is is because it's a much easier destination to arrange flights from um, so especially for, for, for clients from North America rather than any Lao airports. Uh, we don't really include a lot in Bangkok um, because I think most people that have that to choose this trip has probably already been to Thailand before, uh, but I'd certainly recommend um, a couple of extra nights in in Bangkok before they fly back if they if if your clients haven't done it before. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention as well is that um, there is a new railway that has been built in Laos now, and um, it is gone. It is is going from the north uh, in Kunming in China, uh, drops down into Laos and drops down through many rural villages in the north of, of Laos, um, down into Vientiane, the capital, and then it drops down into Thailand and goes on to Bangkok. 
through the peninsula and then down into Singapore. Uh, the Chinese have built this mainly to transport their, their trade down to um, the, the Gulf of Thailand and beyond and to the, the Singapore Straits. But as a, as a side advantage of that, they've, they've also made it accessible for um, passengers. And what we're now looking at doing is, is having a look at our itineraries uh, because this opens up some really excellent destinations in the north of Laos. Destinations actually that we used to travel to, but they were just so difficult to get to. You know, we require 10 hours on the road and really bumpy, windy conditions that it just didn't really feel worthwhile. Whereas now you get to travel on, on a railway, much more comfortable and you can access some really really remote areas so watch this space because we will be looking at developing some some new trips and also reviewing some of our existing product to make use of the railway obviously as a, as a side note as well lowering our uh, our carbon footprint which is always ever ever more important in this world so watch this space for for new product coming for laos finally i just wanted to talk about our trip to pakistan so um, Pakistan, Explore have had a bit of a love affair with uh, Pakistan for many years. Uh, for many years, we have tried and often failed uh, to put together and put on sale a trip in Pakistan. But for many reasons, um, you know, we've we've not really been able to get a trip away. There have been local local issues and um, obviously the war in Afghanistan uh, in the early 2000s also meant that we this this area was just completely inaccessible. Uh, but over in the past few years, um, Pakistan has, has undergone a huge transformation. Imran Khan, the cricketer, has become uh, the prime minister there. And it's become a lot more outward fo facing and a lot more sympathetic to, to, West, to Westerners and, and to Western tourists in particular. And this culminated actually with um, Prince William and, and, and Princess Kate visiting India uh, in 2019 uh, before the pandemic um, and did a tour of Pakistan. And that kind of put it on the map again. And then the UK Foreign Office relaxed its advice for some of Pakistan. So, of course, of course, Explore had to get in there and we had to develop a new trip as soon as we possibly could. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic rather got in the way of that. But uh, this year, I was pleased to launch this, this fantastic itinerary to, to Pakistan. Um, bit of, I mean, just a very, very quick, loose background of, of Pakistan. Um, you know, obviously, the Indian subcontinent, when the British were there, used to be ruled as one. And then when the British left in 47, uh, Pakistan kind of formed its own, own country. Uh, the, the British really crudely uh, drew some lines in the, in, on, on a map and separated India, which had a Hindu majority, from the newly formed state Pakistan, which had a Muslim majority. Um, and that was really how the, the, the country was born. Um, and, you know, in, in drawing those lines, it had displaced uh, many, many communities over this arbitrary line and, and struggles still go on to this day um, for that. And, you know, this is many of many of things you'll hear about Pakistan is, 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 is very crudely related to this. But what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, the, the area that we visit now, the Karakoram Highway, is, is uh, fully in line with UK Foreign Office advice um, and is now safe to travel to. Um, it's not it's probably not the sort of part of Pakistan that you might expect when you think of Pakistan in your mind's eye, because this is all of this trip is all about mountains. Um, the Hindu Kush, the Karakoram and the Himalaya all come together in this part of the world. Um, many, many uh, 8000 plus meter peaks such as K2, very famous. Um, and yeah, it, it, it is it, it, that is the main focus of the journey is the mountains. The other focus of the journey is is really it's about the journey. So uh, this is an overland journey, primarily by four wheel four wheel drive vehicles, and it's about looking out of the window of your of your jeep and taking in that amazing rolling mountain scenery, the glacial lakes, uh, the the forests, and then stopping along, stopping along the way and meeting and, and meeting with friendly people and and eating some fantastic food. Uh, Pakistan is really really it really has some excellent cuisine. Um, a couple of highlights of the trip um, are really uh, along the Karakoram Highway that it, itself. Um, so uh, the villages of, of Gilgit and Karimabad are quite historic um, from Silk Road trading, um, but are really, really charming um, little villages uh, or towns, should I say, along the uh, along the route. Uh, we uh, get a chance to step out and walk on the Paso Glacier. 
Um, Carmel, if you wouldn't mind flicking to the next picture. Um, we also take in these um, the Hussaini suspension bridge, which you can see there on the bottom left hand picture. Um, these very rudimentary pieces of engineering have been erected up and down the um, up and down the the highway to to cross rivers, so to connect communities. Now we won't be walking on them, but we'll certainly be seeing things like this. Um, another fantastic hi highlight is is Fairy Meadows. Um, it, it is an absolutely breathtaking part of the world. Um, it is a bit of a uh, it's a bit arduous to get there, so you have to take a jeep along a very narrow, winding uh, single track mountain road with some quite exposed edges. Um, and then we have a five kilometer walk to Fairy Meadows. But once you're there, you're in this amazing amphitheater of snow capped mountains. And we spend a couple of nights in these beautiful huts that you see in the top left hand picture that just look out onto the mountains and they, and and we do some walking there. So um, it is a it is a it's a it's a classic itinerary. It's what I might call an old school explore itinerary. It's not going to be an easy trip. Um, there are a couple of considerations, I think, to make when when considering this trip for your clients. Um, climatization is, is one of them. So this trip is does operate at altitude. It gets up to about four and a half thousand meters above sea level. Um, a lot has been taken into account with when when considering a climatization. So we have um, we have planned the itinerary to gain in altitude very gently um, to try and aid acclimatization. Um, so no one will, hopefully nobody will suffer too badly with the effects of altitude sickness. Um, but it's also quite, a, it's, it's quite a hardcore itinerary in terms of walking and, and, um, and just in, in general sort of levels of fitness. There are many included walks um, in this itinerary because that really is the own, it's the best way to, to take in the scenery is to get out on foot in the mountains and to experience it firsthand. So to be able to make the most of this itinerary, you know, I would say your clients will, will have to have a, a reasonable level of fitness and, and enjoy walking. Most of the walks are optional. So if they're not feeling up to it at the day, that's fine. They can opt out of it. But there is one, the, the walk up to Ferry Meadows, which is an A to B walk. Um, so that is something to bear in mind. They will need to be able to complete that five kilometer walk up into the mountains. Um, and again, some of the road conditions are um, very, very bumpy. There are some some narrow roads with some exposed drops. Um, so that is just something to bear in mind if you have any nervous passengers, if you have anyone that suffers from severe vertigo. That's a um, another consider consideration to make. Uh, but I think the fact that this is not a straightforward trip and not a straightforward destination just adds to the charm of it. And it really is a it, it is a classic adventure. That's all for me. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, so that's it from us. And I hope that's given you a bit of a flavour for the kind of things that I Explore do. And we're always looking at new product um, as well and looking at where we can develop next. And if you have any questions at all, Sam um, White uh, in our US office can obviously help with anything or put you in touch directly with one of us if you have further questions on these trips. Thanks. Thanks all.